All right. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. I'm filming this in the morning. Uh, glad you could join us as class number three, our focus on the book of Ecclesiastes and finding true meaning in life. Let's begin with a simple, straightforward prayer. Lord, as we ask, we as we study your word, we ask you to be with us and build up our faith, that in all things we grow in confidence and we live for you. Amen. All right. Quick review. Three types of meaning, temporal or short-term meaning, which is fine, but it's not going to last. There's moral meaning, which means our life is has purpose because of the, the good things we do. And then three is the cosmic or meta-narrative. That's the one where it's many chapters making up a book. All the things that happen have meaning because they're all part of God's perfect plan. So last week, the emphasis was on, sorry for the typo, how wisdom was meaningless. How is that the case if we think under the sun? Under the sun means seeing things from an earthly perspective. Well, wisdom helps us to understand things, but it can't change anything. And ultimately, no matter how wise we are, the same fate overtakes us all because this is an imperfect world that will not last. Now, how is, a wisdom, a, how is wisdom a blessing when we think over or beyond the sun? Well, first of all, because we are truly wise in knowing that Christ is our savior and knowing that everything serves God's purpose we can, we can enjoy the, the beauty of creation. We can dig into the amazingness of the human body. Wisdom is a blessing when we see it from the right perspective. So Solomon, the smartest dude ever, tried finding meaning in wisdom. The problem was his perspective was all wrong. Under versus over. He was looking at things from an earthly perspective. And what he realized is the more I learn, the more I see how messed up this world is. And the more I learn or the wiser I get, I realize things should not be the way they are. Never wanted to give up easily, Solomon tried to find another way to find meaning, pleasure. Now, when you hear that word, what sort of things come to mind? Maybe we think of partying and living it up and stuff like that. So yeah, I may think of that carefree, do what you want life, but more generally seeking pleasure means trying to be happy. Now, is that necessarily wrong? No, but you have to see things from, you're probably sick of this phrase, the proper perspective. The new rich. Now the old way of becoming rich, what was it? Um, the author says, past generations saw the goal of life as amassing wealth, doing whatever work was necessary, including work you didn't really enjoy, to secure a comfy retirement. So the old way was work, 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 save up, and then when you're older, you can enjoy it. Now, have you heard about the new way, the new rich? I hadn't. And what that means is this. Why The new rich say, why spend your best days doing work that's often unfulfilling or not enjoyable, so that when you begin to slow down and have aches and pains, then you get to enjoy yourself. The paradigm should be turned on its head. The goal ought to be to design a life in which you can enjoy yourself now. There are two strategies for doing this. One, work more efficiently and in bursts of greater intensity with the goal of then being able to take frequent extended breaks. The example would be work like a dog for six months then take six months off traveling the world. And number two, maximize the aspects of your work you enjoy and minimize the parts of your work life you don't. So it's work, 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 work for six months and then enjoy the fruits and then get back to work. Don't wait until you're old, live your best life now, to quote Dr. Phil. And I think these two statements summarize this mindset. Timothy Ferris, I believe that life exists to be enjoyed. And the Dalai Lama, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. Both of them are seeking pleasure. That's what life is about, it's about pleasure. Right off the bat, what jumps at you as you hear these two phrases, well, it's all about self. My life exists so that I can be happy. And you can probably guess we're going to have an issue down the road. From the author, is it true that you should be pursuing a life of happiness? Should this really be the sum total of your goals in life? Is this really all there is to it? And if so, what happens when you fail to experience happiness? Have you failed at life? Or here is the bigger question. If you're not looking for cosmically meaningful life, a life that is important and valuable, not just because you value it, but because it actually is valuable, can this be achieved through pursuing a life of pleasure and happiness? Believing that the purpose of life is to be happy is far more complicated than it looks. And this is one of the reasons why, even 3,000 years ago, Solomon touches upon it. Did Solomon find a life of pursuing pleasure any more fulfilling and meaningful than a life of pursuing science and learning or wisdom? I think we know the answer to that. Solomon tried with wisdom, had the wrong perspective, found no meaning. And you can probably guess the same is going to happen when he looks for meaning and pleasure under the sun. 
I'm back to Solomon. He was super wise and he was super rich. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for. God says, says this, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. He didn't just have a good amount of money. He had probably literally tons of it with silver and gold. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Just meaning silver and cedar, those are big deals back then. Um, it was everywhere because the king was rich and the kingdom was rich. And then in 1 Kings 10, if you have a second read through that, Solomon for verse after verse shows off just how wealthy he is to the queen of Sheba. So in order to have a happy and meaningful life, and here's important, from an under the sun perspective, what was Solomon lacking? Ultimately nothing. Under the sun means I, I got wisdom, I got money, I got all this good stuff. My life should have meaning. I should be happy. So keep that in mind as we pick apart Ecclesiastes 2. Solomon, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was a reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. And chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So we said this last time, Solomon really works hard. He's not just, you know, going through the motions. He really is trying his hardest to find meaning in life. And this whole section is I tried to make myself happy by doing all these things under the sun. I like how one author said that Solomon was an acquisition happy malcontent, one blessed with the dazzling lifestyle of a corporate raider, but burdened with the wrong soul. I'll translate into English, Solomon had everything, but his heart was in the wrong place. He was focused on himself. He was focused on this life. Now, what has our society taught us to pursue? Some examples, money, education, family, physical gratification. You see those all over the place. But how is all that a chasing after the wind and that nothing was gained? Well, money, I think we all have seen enough the last few years. Money can be great one day and practically worth nothing the next. The stock market tanks and it's gone. Education, I mean, how many kids have a... Um, a degree in Middle Eastern Renaissance poetry. I know that's mixing things, but, and now they can't find a job. Family, we love our families, but think how often families can let us down or how often we let down our family. Physical gratification, yeah, it feels good for a while, but it, it either doesn't last or it can lead to some really bad stuff. In the end, all those things end and they don't truly bring us happiness. Now, Epicurus, Epicurus, you probably heard of him, Epic, Epicurean. Uh, lifestyle, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. In other words, you know, find pleasure in life. And he said this, pleasure is the beginning and the end of a blessed life. We recognize pleasure as the first and natural good. Starting from pleasure, we accept or reject. And we return to this as we judge every good thing, trusting the feeling of pleasure as our guide. In other words, he's just saying, do what makes you happy. Well, how about the rights of others? What if my neighbor has well, a boat <laughs> that I really like? Pleasure would mean I should just go take it. It's all about me. What about self-sacrifice? Well, that's not pleasurable. So I'm not going to do that. What would that do to a family? What would that do to a marriage? What about duty and responsibility? Think if everybody was only thinking about making themselves happy, nothing would get done. It would be completely selfless. Oh, great. There's a phone call, but Kelly will get that. Now, what do those questions do to Epicurus mindset? And worldview. From. There we go. Uh, what do those questions do to Epicurus mindset or worldview? It completely blows it up. If everybody focused only on themselves and being happy, who would go to their jobs? Who would do the grunt work? Who would take time to raise children in, in the proper way? So Epicurus is very much appealing to the sinful nature. It's all about me. 
I want to be happy. And you follow this mindset to the end, life simply becomes a collection of pleasurable experiences. Yeah, but it's an imperfect world. It's a sinful world. If I only focus on making myself happy, that's going to cause a ton of problems. And the follow-up question to that is, well, then so what? Yeah, I have all these pleasurable experiences, but big deal. I think about a big fish I caught two, three years ago. You know, maybe I'd look at the picture and smile, but it doesn't change anything today. It was pleasurable, but it ended and really means nothing now. So if it is all about us being happy, take this into account. The average American lives 29,200 days. Like Solomon, imagine making a list of all the things you did to make yourself happy or that make you happy. Now think about how many of the 29,200 days you spent doing nothing noteworthy by the world's standards. Watching TV, messing around on your phone, sleeping, etc. Would this question possibly come to mind? What of real value have I done with my life? I think so. I, I hear from parents who have older children who maybe move back in the house and they kind of just sit around and do nothing all day. They have to ask this question themselves. What am I doing with my life? I'm trying to make myself happy, but is it really working? From the author, if the focus is on self-gratification, on serving my needs first, despite all the opportunities to serve others, you start to see a problem. So much of our lives has been spent bypassing good works. So much of our lives has, have been self-centered, not other-centered. Self-serving, not other-serving. We stroll through our homes, looking up and down at the blueberry collections, furniture, closets full of clothes, and we begin to feel guilt, guilt that we've been seeking to take care of ourselves far more than others. So if it's pleasure, if it's happiness, if that's the key goal in life, again, we're going to turn our back on others. And very clearly, we're not going to be carrying out our function as Christians. Also, how much time, how much of our time seeking pleasure and happiness have come at the expense of others? Uh, examples, maybe a simple one would be, think about like a father who's obsessed with golf or something. So he's golfing all the time. He's happy. But what about his wife? What about his kids? And there's so many other examples you could use, but when we make it about ourselves, others suffer. So bummer, right? All we do means nothing in the end and we'll die and those feelings of pleasure and happiness will fade away forever. Yeah, if you only see it from that perspective. That's the way it'll be if we view things with an under the sun mentality. If we think it's only about this life, yeah, it'll happen, we'll die, it'll all be forgotten. So we should seek to give, 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 serve, 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 and never draw an ounce of happiness or pleasure out of life? No, not at all. But we must see things from the right perspective. So yes, life is meant to be enjoyed. Great proof, the Garden of Eden. What did God do? He created mankind to bear children, create families, form communities, all those good things. And what do we do in those groups? We're happy. We love spending time with family. We love being with friends who are like us. We love doing things together as a group. So what it means is we're appreciating the gifts God has given and ultimately brings pleasure to us. It makes us happy. And that is certainly an enjoyable life. Some other things God wants us to enjoy. Psalm 104, he makes wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. So God wants us to find pleasure in a good meal, a glass of wine, oil to shine their faces. They would put oil on to, uh, for their dry skin in a, in a pretty rough climate. These are simple things, but God says, yeah, and God made these for us. These gladden our hearts. These bring us pleasure. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. God wants us to find pleasure in creation, to stop and think about or to appreciate what God has done. Yeah, that brings pleasure to us. Sorry to keep using the fishing analogy, but I'm getting kind of itchy to get out there. Um, I can enjoy the amazingness of God's creation, the beauty, how it works together when, when I'm out fishing. That's a good thing. To find pleasure in that is a gift from God. And the teacher, Solomon, agrees. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. Say, yeah, enjoy the things that God has given. See it from the right perspective. It's a gift from him. Therefore, I will find pleasure in them. Back to the author. If there's a reason, a design, a purpose for the human ability to enjoy relationships, to take pleasure in sunsets, and to seek the thrill of adventure, and if that purpose comes from above humans themselves and is in fact infused into the very purpose of the universe, then we can say the pleasures we experience are cosmically meaningful, but only if their purpose comes from over the sun. 
under the sun, earthly perspective, pleasures considered only within the realm of a godless, purposeless world lose their cosmic meaning. It's a fancy way of saying, if you see things only for this life, you enjoy pleasure for a short time, it ends and nothing has changed. When we understand that this is not our home, but heaven is, and we enjoy the fact that we are part of God's family, we can take pleasure in all the gifts that God gives us until he calls us home. But in this world of sin, of course, there's pleasure and pain. What biblical point does that drive home? Well, that sin is a part of this world. That there are constant... <laughs> Nobody called or texted all morning, and I just got like 16 of them in the last 10 minutes. Anyways, um, the fact that it's not a perfect world, and it will not last. We brought sin into it, and there are consequences. There are ple there's pleasure and pain. And what should that cause us to do about how we view today? Well, today is a gift from God. Um, but I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm going to worry about today. But the future, though, it's an understanding of saying it's not about amassing things in this life or having all these pleasurable experiences. It's about staying focused on my Lord. And ultimately, it leads us to a time when the ultimate pleasure will be ours, the pleasure of heaven. And God's megaphone. I like this uh, from C.S. Lewis. He said, uh, The biblical meta narrative." meaning everything working together for good, puts, in the midst, puts us in the midst of an epic story, the greatest tragedy of which is that humans, first through greed, walked away from God. In response to this tragedy, God did nearly two incomprehensible things. He promised that someday he'd come to earth himself to defeat the murderer. And he also allowed pain and frustration to make its way through our world so we would never fool ourselves into thinking that we're all right without him. As C.S. Lewis once said, Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. If it was all about pleasure and we were just perfectly happy all the time, we would almost instantly stop focusing on God because we don't need him. Instead, God allows these to keep us focused that this is not our home. Heaven is. And a great example of this, marriage. Pleasures and pains that come up in marriage. Pleasures, you have companionship. Uh, there's that closeness. You can support one another, help one another, all those good things. Pains, well, sometimes you have to sacrifice for your spouse. In an imperfect world, there are arguments. And so there's there's positives and there's negatives that happen in a marriage. But what is marriage really about? Commitment, service, respect, honor. And when those things are present, what is the natural result, a gift from God? That you can enjoy, you can enjoy your spouse. You can see your spouse as a gift from God, and you can find pleasure in that. Now, Jesus in the two greatest commandments, he tells us to do what? What is the result for us and others? He said, love God and love our neighbor. Because I love God, I will love my neighbor. If my neighbor loves God, well, then he will love me. It's like a husband and wife when they respect and honor one another. It works well. The same it should be in all our relationships. When we are doing what is expected of us and others are doing what's expected of them, that it makes for a very pleasurable life. From the author. And so we're called to a life that ends up finding pleasure without living for it. I think that's a great phrase. Living for pleasure means what do I have to do to make myself happy? Instead, when we carry out our calling as believers, we will find pleasure with our families, in our marriages, with our friends, or enjoying creation. This life of love brings us pleasure from three sources. Knowing the biblical meta narrative that everything is a part of God's plan. Serving others. And tell me that's not pleasurable. That, that feeling of being able to serve others. And pausing to simply enjoy the pleasures of life in God's world. And I would say there's no place better to do that than on the front of a boat. And Solomon agrees with this. So I commended the enjoyment of life because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. He says, I commend it. You're living out your life. You know where you're going. You know the Lord is with you. And as you go through life, the Lord blesses you with pleasure after pleasure because you have focus on the right perspective. So in closing, life is beautiful. God did build us for pleasure and so much more. That's what the author said. And final comment, how can only a Christian truly say and believe that? Well, first of all, because God's involved. But life is beautiful only when we understand that, yeah, there is pain. There is heart. There is suffering. But life is beautiful because, A, it's a gift from God. B, God brought us into his family. C, it gives us an opportunity to show our thanks. And D, heaven is our home. We can enjoy today because we know that today the Lord will be with us. We can enjoy tomorrow for the same reason. 
and we can enjoy every day God gives us. We can have pleasure and be happy because we know a time is coming where we, be, we will be welcomed to our eternal home. So I guess the main point for this one has been we don't live for pleasure. We live to serve our God. But in doing that, God blesses us in many cases with a happy life. No, it's not perfect. But that only reminds us that we are going to a perfect home. So there you go. Thanks for joining. Uh, we have two more classes. We will have that video out next week. God bless.